Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, awesome to see you all. And I can't believe we're already at week two as we get going on this journey. Um, I am um, just super exhilarated to, to, to get started. Um, so I hope you all had a great first week. The goal for the first week was to get you talking about your own personal goals. So before you start thinking about what project I wanna do, just asking yourself, what do I value? What is important to me? What are my goals in the next 10 weeks? Uh, the pre-survey, I hope you guys have, uh, did that, uh, was really designed to just get you thinking about these things that are important personally to you. And because once you start digging deep into the project, um, you want to have those elements there, at least at the surface level, because you want to understand how they connect to the project that you're building. Uh, the better the connection, I think the, it shows, it comes across especially when you're talking to people, funders and so forth. And so today I'm super excited to have Nisha with us today because uh, she was a former fellow, past cohort. And so she'll be part of this discussion that we're gonna have. And this really is much designed to be a discussion. Uh, what I uh, will do first, and Nisha will do intros a little bit um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, what I will do is do a quick review. I hope you all were able to do some of the pre-readings and the video that I sent you in the event that you didn't, in the unlikely event that you didn't, I will summarize very quickly, okay? Very quickly <laughs> so that we can get going with the actual uh, discussion because I really want to get into that discussion and really get um, pinging you guys a little bit more. Okay, so uh, in a really quick summary, and I'll take about 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll use the rest of the time to discuss the individual uh, projects. Okay, so big thing, finding problem, solution, fit. That's a really critical aspect um, of this week as we build on each uh, from, from last week. Some quick reminders, take advantage of Slack. If you haven't done the pre-program survey, please do it. Slack is huge. We post everything on there and I'll keep reminding you to please take advantage of it, engage. Um, um, the funding, please keep in mind um, as an update, we will share, you guys should receive the first payment um, end of, by next Monday, okay? So watch out for that. Uh, we already set it up, so you should receive it. Apologies for the short delay. And then communicate with your mentors, please communicate, communicate, communicate. Stuff happens. If you have to change your schedule for any reason, please communicate, tell them, don't wait till the last minute. Just tell them way ahead of time, okay? Pitch day is November 13th, more details later, but the pitch deck sample slides, actually, if you wanna see some, some of the past uh, presentations from last cohort, you can see this in a folder that I created in the um, your resource folder, okay? So if you have not explored it, I highly recommend you go in there and look at the sample deck slides and also some sample logic models that are in there as well. So you should absolutely take advantage of those as a reference point. And remember, chat with me twice at least. I've already talked to one of you already. So yay, I'm super excited about that. Okay, so if you forget everything, the long story short, if you watched the video already, is that you gotta start with the problem. I can't emphasize this enough. Nisha is probably hopefully some, uh, remembering this from last time. Huge deal here. People tend to forget this component and to rush straight to the solution. Remember, a problem well stated is problem half solved. Huge, 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 okay? This is what normally happens, and this is a mistake if you try to do this, okay? It's gonna be very obvious if you're trying to, and we'll find out very shortly. So remember again, problem well stated, the problem well solved. So big thing here, there is such thing called problem space and this thing called solution space. And if you separate them, it really opens up the world to thinking about, you know, in the problem space, what is there in the background, the context, the landscape, you know, um, what is the impact of the problem, the scale of the problem, and then framing it in a way that is actually tangible and approachable. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do today, very deeply with each of you, as we try to get a better understanding of what this is like. And on the other side, you have the solution space, right? Solutions, uh, prototype in this space. And this is where most of, most of us live. We rush here very quickly. I have a solution. I know how to solve this. And the danger there is I think you start there and then you try to fit a problem into that solution space. Better to really explore and, and figure that 
on the other side. There were two case studies in the video. If you have not uh, checked it out, please do check it out. They're really insightful and fun, actually. The slow ele elevator problem and the dog adoption problem. Make sure you may remember that from last, from last cohort. They're a lot of fun to think about because they really illustrate this idea of the problem space, how we can really, if you frame the problem correctly, you can design the correct or the right solution, the best solution for that problem. So again, um, skip this problem space. And in the middle here, you have this problem solution space, which again is a really exciting space to be. Uh, I try to encourage you not to rush this over, even if especially you think your idea is great, check the notes and bolts, open the trunk and make sure that the foundation here is solid. Okay. And the point of reframing is not to find the real problem, but rather to see if there's a better one to solve. Okay. And I'm going through this quickly because uh, again, you can watch the pre-recording of the other lecture uh, in, in, the, in the curriculum that I sent you all. So how do you search for the problem solution fit? This is where the logic model comes in. Now, if you didn't know what this is until today, um, it's a fantastic little tool that we use. And uh, what it ultimately is, is really a theory of change, you know, visually linking the connections between the problem and the solution and all the stuff you want to do, the activities and the measuring of those things that you're doing. And then the outcomes. And we're going to go through each, each one of these, okay, as you do your um, uh, logic model building. And ultimately, the intended impact. What are you trying to actually do? And what change do you seek? And then most importantly, for, for whom? Okay, very important to remember. Who on earth are you trying to uh, have an impact on? Who is your audience? Okay, and you can actually do an audience segmentation to really get to the bottom of the person that you are trying to impact. And it's really critical also you do that at this stage. So you can flip this around and really think about causes and effects leading to some change of interest that you want to see. Okay, that is a behavior as an outcome, a behavioral change that you want to see. Okay, you can have, and this is an important aspect as well, the difference between an output and an outcome. We'll get to it, okay, in the next one or two weeks. So this is what the logic model looks like. Now in the logic model workbook that I sent you all, it does not look like this, okay? <laughs> this is the visualized version, the beauti beautified version, where is the problem, there's a mission, you know, the uh, hypothesis that you're testing and all these components that together, you know, have this cycle, this logic that is there. Another way to frame it, it is the set of what, you know, if then statements, if you had the resources, then blah would happen. If you were able to do certain set of activities, then blah would happen. If you were able to you know, accomplish the activities, then you'll have delivered the services plan. Exactly, right? So you can measure these services um, and the impact number of uh, uh, classes you held out, number of attendees, right? How many people click liked? Uh, these are all outputs, okay? The outcomes then, it's a very different thing. Outcomes you get into the change in behavior that is taking place okay so not we can we'll definitely get into um the weeds of that in week two and uh, week three and four as we get into evaluation and so forth so the logic model again is really about framing the problem okay it's a really critical aspect of this and in framing the problem you kind of want to know the background right the context and you want to do your homework here there's no shortcut there is no shortcut here. You got to understand and do that homework to get to that framework. Um, so again, encourage you to spend a little time in this space. It's a beautiful space. I love it. The what, when, where, who, um, and we're going to get into that uh, as well. And this I already mentioned, do your homework, do your homework, talk to some users. Um, and I've already mentioned this to my the first person I talked to already. Talk to your users if you can. Okay. Don't assume stuff. Okay. Don't assume stuff. I'll repeat that. Don't assume stuff. All right. Because you're going to get caught if you do so. Okay. Or we'll bite you if you do so. So this week, hopefully, yeah, I think that was a good time. So this week, the whole goal is to really focus on this problem solution space. All right. And are framing the problem, reframing it. And, and so with your individual mentors, you're going to have a little tug of war a little bit as you try to get to the weeds of understanding that and then connecting the dots and seeing well does the approach that i'm proposing 
make sense for the problem the way it's framed right now, right? And if you emerge out of this, that you're more convinced that your approach is right, good for you. However, should you suddenly realize, actually, I'm trying to tackle a whole different problem for a very different solution, it's okay to revisit and change your approach, okay? Or even reframe the problem to a point where you realize I need to uh, change my approach entirely. That's fine, okay? You don't have to stick with what you propose in your application. Um, what we really want you to embody here is that the process is what really we care about, that you went through, framed the problem in a way that is tangible, approachable, and you've thought about a solution that makes sense, that is specific, that has a targeted audience that you can target and address, okay? Everything below here, the inputs, we won't go over today at all. We're not going to touch it. Okay, so what we're gonna do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is that we're gonna have a conversation, all right? A really active conversation. And I would encourage you, and as we do these sessions in the weeks to come, it's gonna be heavy conversation. You guys have done the reading, you have watched the video, hopefully uh, from uh, in, in the curriculum. And also from just my quick summary here today, hopefully it sparked some questions, but also I'm gonna be pointing some directed questions to you all, okay? and saying like, hey, Sam, tell me more about your problem, right? Articulate the problem for me. And so you're gonna be ready when you come to these sessions to be called out uh, uh, point blank and for you to be able to share. And then for the rest of you, you don't just sit there quietly. Oh, no, 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 no. Engage, um, provide feedback. If something does not make sense, absolutely say so. Like that does not make sense. <laughs> Okay, and that's perfectly fine. I would warn you now, I, will, I tend to do that a lot, okay, where something does not make sense, or I wish to push you a little bit, I will do so. We're all friends here. This is a safe space for us to do this. And I, the way I think of it is, it's, um, I find it a privilege to be able to talk to you all and, and, and share these ideas and have you have your attention where we can engage and exchange ideas. And that's the whole build up to even Thursday when we have the collab exchange. I hope you take some of these elements today and kind of um, use them at uh, that session because you're going to be talking with people and they'll be saying lots of different things uh, over the window of time. So don't worry, we, we won't get you immediately started. I want to at this time um, take a chance uh, to introduce uh, Nisha. And so Nisha, are you still there? Let's see. Um, perfect. Yes. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. see you. Sorry, my video was hiding somewhere else. I will get back to this in a second. Um, uh, so Nisha, I will do a very brief, uh, but Nisha, I want you to take time to introduce yourself. Um, and most importantly, give us a sense of your project. Tell us, your, give us your quick uh, um, uh, pitch and really focus in on that initial stages, right? The problem articulation. Uh, what was that experience like for you to go through that of trying to revisit and understanding, okay, who am I trying to solve this problem for? And is the design sufficient? Um, so with that, Nisha was a cohort five. And so Nisha, uh, welcome. And I'm looking forward to having, having this conversation with you and the rest of the uh, fellows. Thank you, Fanuel. So hi, my name is Nisha. I am a postdoc at, um, here in Maryland. I live in Virginia, but I work in Maryland. And uh, my project, Be Stimnista, Basically, our goal is to train teachers, specifically STEAM teachers, in order to help them make their classes more culturally relevant. And just to give you like a little bit of my background, I am from Puerto Rico. Um, so my target audience initially is going to be uh, students, teachers uh, from Puerto Rico. Eventually, I plan on expanding, right? But um, I don't know if you guys have heard that in 2017, uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico really hard. Like we were months without power and many other um, situations. After that, in 2019, there were also a couple earthquakes, specifically in the southern region of the island, and that's where I grew up, uh, where I went to school. Um, and then we have the pandemic on top of that. So three events, right? Basically, one after the other really uh, made some some damage in terms of like the, the educational. Uh, part, right, of, of the, the island. So 
I want to read a little bit, like a little piece of um, my application, my SAI application is the, the problem on the... So basically I describe all this situation that happened in Puerto Rico and then how the students of course are having a hard time uh, getting their education, how teachers are having a tough time uh, trying to engage their students and how families, right, their parents and families and communities are being affected. Um, then my solution, this is what I wrote, Vistimnista will serve as a resource where teachers, parents, and students can access educational material and other information that will aid in teaching, learning, and in career decision-making. Original and culturally relevant activities such as coloring books, stories, short projects, blogs, workshops, interviews, articles, and books will be accessible on a main website. Collaborators such as Ciencia Puerto Rico, SACNAS, and other volunteers can help increase the impact of this project and the student's sense of belonging. So I think that's great, but that's a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about teachers, students, communities, of them, it's a lot, right? Um, and then let's see, I wanna share kind of like, the, the end, towards the end of the program, how, how things change a little bit. So my solution at the end, by the end of the program, I said, Vistim Nista will provide four workshops to train teachers in how to make their classes more culturally relevant, incorporate arts in STEM, develop community projects and collaborate with STEM professionals who can serve as mentors. So already uh, you can see that I went down, right? Specifically, my target are gonna be teachers. Um, and then I'm focusing on providing workshops. So I, I, I hope that gave you an example of how things change, right? And how, how targeted you can be. And then I had the problem of the problem of stating the problem um, because yes, I was mainly focusing on the solution. I started thinking, okay, so how can I solve all these problems, the solution? And then Fano was always like, spend time thinking on the problem. Like We always spend too much time on the solution, but focus on the problems. So I'm like, oh man, what can I do? Um, and then there was another workshop, uh, another seminar focused on evaluation, right? And I think you guys, maybe it's the next one for you guys. Um, so there they, they taught us how to think about questions, right? Uh, it could be questions to kind of, test your, uh, have an idea of your audience who could be your audience or your target or questions for actually evaluating your program. Um, so then I said, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do a Google form. So I did that, I did a Google form with you know a list of questions. I identified different teachers in Puerto Rico and I sent the Google form and they replied, the, the teachers, you know, I had a good amount of teachers from around the island who answered. So they gave me a better idea of what, what was going on, right? And um, let me see, can I share Fanwell or no? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, go ahead. Let's see if I have, yeah, share. Do you see it or? Uh, yeah, we see it. PowerPoint? Okay, so basically I'm just gonna show you from that um, Google form, uh, I got these answers. So now I can identify, for example, that the teachers, they have lack of resources. 50% of them said lack of resources. And then the teachers also said that the curriculum is not adapted to the student's need. So that helped me like confirm, yes, they need more culturally relevant um, you know, curriculum and other tools or activities that can help them uh, engage with the students. These are Puerto Rican students, things that we can identify in their communities, in their schools that can help the teachers say, okay, this is the way I should teach them STEAM. And then uh, they also mention other things like how they have uh, very little collaborations, how they rarely incorporate arts. Um, and other things like uh, the students having problems identifying 
problems in the community and using the scientific method to solve those problems because that's that's part of the self-identity and the culturally relevant teaching right if if you can train your students to identify problems in their community they are applying the scientific method so they they can say okay science is not just a course that i'm taking in my school to pass to get a grade it's something that i can apply and eventually, of course, maybe not all of them are going to become scientists, but they can be advocates and they can uh, apply the different uh, sciences or STEAM in their daily basis. So at the end of the day, like I mentioned, Vistimnista is going to be providing workshops or seminars, but there are four uh, basic things uh, or goals in Vistimnista. So it doesn't matter which topic I'm covering in those workshops. I have to have uh, you know, incorporated education, self-identity, community, and careers, right? And with those four goals, I'm actually making sure that there is a culturally relevant uh, teaching process, right? We know, I know that teachers are already doing their job in terms of educating, giving a class, but are they helping their students with the self-identity become scientists, for example, or that they know people uh, in their community who are scientists, or that they can use science or STEM to solve problems in their community, and that eventually they can also uh, identify different careers within STEM or STEAM. So that's kind of how I, I try to identify the problem and then you know, try to target a little bit better which was uh, or which are gonna be my, my audience. And then in terms of the landscape, which is also important, right? Because if we're doing something, it should be something a little bit different, something that someone else is not already doing um, or a problem that someone is not solving yet. So I looked in Puerto Rico, which are the, the main STEM organizations that are helping uh, students uh, that are giving opportunities for students in STEM, that they're always like advocating, right? And creating these opportunities. And these are three of them, Ciencia Puerto Rico, but Ciencia Puerto Rico, their main target is to create like a network of uh, graduate students and undergraduate students. Eco Exploratorio is more like a museum, museum. So it's like a science uh, museum where it's more like family oriented, right? So the, the kids can go with their families, parents uh, there. And Ciencia en Tus Manos is a, a more uh, kind of like social. So they're in Facebook, they have Twitter, um, you know, they're like more like a young, I call them like the young group trying to uh, reach to K-12 students and undergrads. So they're doing a great job. And in fact, uh, I'm a member of most of these groups, but their main target are not teachers. And yes, I would love to be there with the students, you know, and do activities with them. But first of all, I don't have the time, right? And second, I think that if I can train teachers, they have the opportunity to reach out to more students, right? And, and eventually expand what, what I would like to see, the effect that I would like to see. So that's the difference with Bistimnista. We're mainly targeting teachers, making their STEAM classes more culturally relevant. And that's what I wanted to, to share with you guys to give you an idea. Um, and now I'd like to, to hear some of your ideas. And if you have any questions, just let me know, ask me. That's, that's wonderful. And, and I love that you took us through your application. I, that was on, on the, we did not plan this at all. She, she did that by herself. <laughs> I was yeah. like, whoa, are you sure? <laughs> Um, so before we get going with everybody sort of sharing their problem statements, questions, comments from, from the fellows at all for, for uh, Nisha, because I think you also thrive on getting, you know, oh, that's an interesting idea of comments, right, or suggestions. So this is an opportunity for you to also practice asking these deep questions against uh, a pitch uh, on, on the problem side, uh, for example. So the floor is open. Thanks for presenting, Nisha. Um, I had a question about how you were able to narrow down your problem statement. So you talked about the Google survey form was one of the ways, like 
what else kind of led you besides, did you use other resources besides just that survey? Or it was just like, you know, hey, I understand this is too broad. I see the impact more at the teacher space. And like, like, what was the process of narrowing it down like for you? Yeah, so besides the survey, I think it's really important doing that, like having that communication with, with teachers in my case. So I have also um, calls, I have emails. And then throughout the um, SAI, when I was there, like it's an ongoing process, right? And things change. It was, it didn't go from all these things to this one thing. It was like a process. So I'm reading, you know, like everything, every resource that you can find. But in my case, it was the survey and keeping a communication with, with them to, to actually know what's happening right now in Puerto Rico. Because what I proposed was based on my experience as a student there. And then what I think that I'm seeing, right? But I'm not, for example, I'm not in Puerto Rico anymore. I'm not a student anymore. So talking with them, speaking to them. Okay, thank you. That helped me. And I think, you know, the timing is the three, the three weeks that you have now, we're gonna do the problem. And we're gonna have two weeks of just talking about evaluation. It's really just one big window where we get to discuss the logic model quite a lot. So they are truncated like this, you know, on the curriculum, but really this conversation will keep going. It's not going to stop. We just initiate, think of this as initiating part of the problem discussion, and we're just going to keep adding on top of the discussion. Uh, Kushbu, did you have a comment there? Thanks, Rose. Thanks. Hi, hi, Nisha. Thank you for sharing your project. It's super cool, um, and it's it's super interesting because um, I I am a STEM education grad, so I feel like I relate on on like a lot of levels. So I think it was really inspiring, especially especially for me. Um, and I had one uh, particular question, uh, which was about how do you keep it going after the project is done? Like, is there uh, a newsletter that you still you know send out to the like the organizations that you mentioned? You know, just to kind of ensure that they're still in the loop and like how do you keep it going I'm, I'm just curious like uh, for the sustainability and the maintenance part mm -hmm. yeah that's super important that's, that's one of the main things right that you want with your project um, for me uh, so I I just finished right the SAI um, uh, training so basically I've been trying to learn more from the teachers. And um, I was telling you, Fanuel, at the beginning that I just identified a group in Puerto Rico. It's called Aula en la Montaña, which is translates to classroom in the mountains. And this is in Peñuelas, where I went to school. They identified a community. It's, it's a rural community, so really rural. Like I, I have never visited. They're in Peñuelas, and I, I never, I didn't even knew about them. Um, they have around 17, 20 students from uh, different ages. So geographically, they already have a problem, right? It's, it's, it's hard for them to go to school. And then on top of that, they still have like the, the power, electricity. They, they have like four days a week, they have electricity. So internet is really hard for them. There's like one or two houses um, that only have uh, the service available. So they have a group of teachers who are volunteering in that group. And every Saturday they go to the, the, the community, right? To, have, to teach the students to create different activities. So um, I basically I contacted them. I kept, I, I, I'm just I'm always seeking for like opportunities or who can I help um, with, with the program? And yes, now by the end, in, by the end of October, we should have our first formal training like uh, or seminar with Bistimista is going to be offering uh, trainings for them and yeah just trying to learn how is the community what are the needs and then how can I uh, incorporate STEAM with culturally relevant activities so yeah and then um, from there hopefully <laughs> things will keep uh, going but but yes you I would say you have to like keep seeking for for your opportunities for who who can you help? Like, how can you help them? Yeah, and I know it's hard, we are all busy, right? But it's something that, it's something that is in our hearts because we're, we're, we're giving time to do this. So yeah, you, you, you'll find the time and, and you'll make it work. 
and we hope the funding also helps and is one Absolutely. big change uh, so, in Asia. We yeah, of course. The funding this year. <laughs> yeah. So this is like again, I'm doing just baby steps right now, and this is very small right now. My program, it's it's just me. I'm starting with this, but yeah, eventually, um, you know, as as I prove that it's working, right? I'm gonna be giving several um, workshops and getting data from from those workshops. And then little by little, eventually I would like to write a grant and see what happens. And from there, keep growing, collaborating with SAI and different fellows. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. That's super helpful. Awesome. So we want to continue discussion. So you guys will get a chance now to tell my, both myself and everybody here, we want to hear a little bit of your problem solution space discussion in your minds as this stands right now. You're going to spend the rest of the week trying to perfect this and We'll be curious to see how it evolves over time. Um, so, okay, I'm just gonna look at my screen and point to someone and you're gonna give us a short spiel, okay? Uh, so also the key here is give us that kind of a landscape, the way you understand it right now. And we're gonna try poke holes in it, okay? So let's get going. Rose, get us started. Get that muted. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, all right, so... Um... Hi, I'm Rose, um, and the I guess the the idea that I pitched for SAI um, is called Ewoham. And so for me, the problem that I identified was that human evolution has been a controversial topic, both in general, but also it's teaching in high schools. Um, and this is just from my personal experience. It seems that public knowledge is really limited to a few fossils, best case scenario, and oftentimes. Uh, because of its limited teaching, I feel like it leads to more questions that could be answered, but they're not often due to like limited access to opportunities beyond just, you know, traditional museum exhibits. And if you don't frequent the museums or if you're not going to those exhibits, right, you're not getting exposed to those types of answers. Um, and then the only other opportunities typically are through like lecture based education at the college level. And, you know, these are all great communication mediums and they can be effective uh, for some people. But what I've seen is that hands on and interactive material helps to expand this potential outreach for education, particularly human evolution. And so uh, the idea I came up with Evo Hom, it, it's, it's striving to bridge this gap um, between access to current knowledge of human evolution and evolutionary concepts uh, to the public through interactive medium that everyone can enjoy, which is board games. Um, and so my hope is to develop Evil Home, uh, which is a board game uh, about human evolution. And so players uh, will have a different scenario each time. So you're picking a different scenario and these scenarios are based on um, different time points throughout human evolution. And so it kind of sets the stage and it's still in, in works, especially once I start talking about, uh, I guess, like my thought process once I started watching these lectures and, and reading through the materials. Um, but I thought, oh, well, maybe this could be a collaborative game where there working together to survive as a species and kind of make it on to the next level, right? Um, and so I was hoping that you could also develop either some sort of workshop or lesson plan for teachers uh, that can be used in conjunction with a board game to maximize this experience. So the idea is that um, I'm marketing this more towards um, high school students just because of the advanced level of like <laughs> what I'm hoping to convey um, in terms of these evolutionary concepts, but I'd also like to help um, fund providing these games for schools by also appealing to families and, and the public. So through their purchase of the games, I'm hoping to be able to provide these games for free to educators in like rural communities and also urban communities who might not have access to this sort of um, interactive education, especially with human evolution. Um, sorry, that was really long. Okay, but okay, this is this is good. This is good. Okay, yeah. okay, guys, the floor is open. I, I, we could do, we could go in there, and take it apart. But <laughs> uh, what are some questions that uh, that arise for you? Does it make sense? Um, I feel like uh, Sam, you have something. I feel like you want to say something. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I love the idea. Uh, but it's not entirely clear to me how you get from the problem to that specific solution. Uh, like there's a lot of, uh, there seems to be a lot. Uh, it, also your, your problem statement is, uh, 
it suffers from the same problem that mine does, uh, or that mine has before I talk to other people about it, uh, of being, you know, kind of broad and uh, more philosophical and, you know, uh, then incredibly specific, like identifying that specific problem. Uh, and so getting, getting to um, your solution, which I, which I like, I just don't know if it's exactly the solution for the problem that you stated, uh, which was, you know, big and societal level. Uh, and, uh, but uh, one thing I, I, I would love to ask though, especially about your solution is why, why a game versus any of the other possible interactive things that you could have done, especially given how hard it is to make a game that has both like reasonable mechanics, but is also actually like interesting and fun to play. So the whole board game concept is a bit of a bias thing on my end. Uh, I'm a big board gamer. Um, and over the, over the pandemic, my husband and I, we developed um, a board game and we ran across a lot of issues in terms of funding and things like that. But I was like, hey, there's the potential for, for education. I was thinking back to when I was a student and all the different interactive activities we did in the classroom. And I mean, as far as I'm aware of a lot, most people that I know enjoy playing board games. And I was like, well, could this be utilized as a tool in the classroom to help teach concepts that would otherwise be boring. I mean, you can list off all the fossils and set all the landscapes, but oftentimes it's really dry, right? You're just like this fossil and that fossil, but what if you brought them to life and you're actually like playing through this story of human evolution? And so I guess I thought it'd be a fun interactive way because I enjoy playing board games. I know a lot of people do. And I thought, well, hey, maybe this could be a potential solution. And like you were saying, you know, even after going through the lectures, I was like, oh, wow, you know, it's more like you were so focused on the solution, you weren't thinking about the problem. But then I was like, okay, so, you know, talking with the teachers, talking with students, identifying like where they most need in their lesson plans, how, um, you know, I know they teach evolutionary concepts, but what would be most useful for them? And then formulating the board game around that and what they're interested in and what their needs are for their curriculum instead of just like specifically being focused on the solution. Yeah, I'm glad, glad you saw that. They, they, we fell in, we've, we tend to fall in love with our solution given our own expertise oh, and yeah. comfort levels, right? <laughs> um, but I think you can still, there's a sweet spot in there um, uh, that you can get in and still marry the two. So uh, you mentioned personal experience. I mean, get some, do some of, that, some of that landscaping, right? Just to get that sense. Uh, Nisha, did you have any quick comments? I'm gonna try and go through everybody. So this is a first trial run with Rose. <laughs> uh, Nisha, anything quick? <laughs> no, like my mind went to the business, more like to the business sales aspect of it. So like if I go to a store and I see all these games, like why should I choose that game? Like, you know, as it could be as a student, as a parent, or whatever, or just because I like to play games, why? Like, why I'm gonna go there to the store and, and choose that one? So maybe I, I would like to know a little bit more of, of the actual concept, like how are you gonna develop the actual game? Um, yeah. Ideas and all that. So, so Rose, don't answer that, okay? okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep that uh, food for thought because we're going to get through this uh, several weeks um, as well. I, I think the problem is really critical. It connects to that problem, right? How this is all going to play out in the long run. So Rose, thank you for that. Hopefully this was an uh, inspiration for you, again, to really think deep about that problem and oh, get yeah. to, to be succinct and clear about it. Um, Sarah, I, I'll go up to her because she, she, she typed hers next. Um, Let's see, actually, I'm going to try. There's a lot to read there. Sarah, if you can do it, this, I'm going to pass you for a second. I'm going to have you, hopefully you can jump in at some point and, and, and say the, the, your quick spiel. Um, okay, Mandy, could you give us a quick one? Problem sure. statement, okay? Let's, let's, let's do hear it. it. <laughs> okay, so the problem that I'm aiming to solve is to address the problem that by the time girls reach high school, there's an apparent gender gap in interest in STEM and the likelihood to pursue STEM fields and enjoy STEM classes. Um, and there's the secondary problem of girls typically lack, and I need data obviously to support this, um, girls typically struggle with self-confidence and 
you know, we have an obesity epidemic and there's obviously a lot there. So I definitely know I have to narrow down, but I'm trying to relate uh, need for health and self-confidence to uh, the, the need for continued interest in STEM. So then my solution is a program called STEM uh, Sports STEM Steminus. <laughs> Um, I've been playing around with a uh, name. So Nisha, actually, I, I played around with Steminista for a little bit. And I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> um, but my solution is to use sports as a medium to engage middle, middle school girls with STEM activities and STEM-related career paths while empowering them to develop a strong body and a strong mind. That's that's awesome. Wow, I like that. Uh, very clear to it. Uh, my quick... Uh feedback to both of you that have gone so far is, you know, I think both of you think about narrowing it down for sure, right? You always want to do more, and Nisha beautifully illustrated this, right? You always want to do more than, than is necessary, perhaps, right? So you kind of craft that question that you then you know who is it for and what area. You mentioned things like confidence, right? You mentioned like some STEM specific uh, performance, it's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> you can't do it all. So you have to narrow down and get some, some data. And data does exist, guys, for all of you. Data is out there. And if it's lacking, that's a thing as, as well. You can try and find, okay? Anybody have a quick comment or question for Mandy? Uh, Mandy I yeah. had a quick question. Um, uh, so uh, speaking from personal experience, I love sports and I love STEM but I have friends who hate sports and hated STEM. And, uh, and, and there's, this is like literally a group of girls who would uh, like, when we would have like the sports period in school, they would like prefer sitting under a tree um, and just like gossiping. And I wonder like, how would you cater to these specific groups? Um, um, yeah, in particular, I'm just, I'm just curious because they exist. <laughs> of course, of course. And I think time, do you want me to answer that or? Uh, yeah, yeah go for it. Think go about for that? It. No, no, okay. a answer a little bit and think some more. <laughs> of course. So the, the, I guess, easiest answer right now, obviously is still thinking about that, but there is a wide variety of sports. And I believe that there are sports for everyone, whether it's not as high intensity, whether it's um, more leisure sports. I remember I took a class in high school and I was like, oh, these sports exist. And it's just pretty chill, but still something that, um, it's active activity and sports are not all just like soccer and sprinting. Like um, there's a wide variety. So that's what I'm thinking initially, but that's a good point. <laughs> I am an advocate of including arts. So like putting some music, theater, things like that there where there's physical activity. Of course, dance, definitely a big one. Yeah, I think you'll see you it's going to be narrowing it down. And, and I know Jessica, your, your mentor, she will she will narrow it down for you. <laughs> She's fantastic at that. Um, OK, Mandy, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to see how all these program projects uh, shape up. OK, Sam, tell us. Sure, happy to. Uh, so my uh, the problem that I'm trying to approach is that there does not exist any formal training or courses whatsoever for uh, people who want to communicate mathematics. Like they, it flat out just doesn't exist at all. Uh, and even for the places where more general science communication uh, is done, be they, uh, you know, less formal uh, things like uh, com sci -com, things like that, um, there is uh, very rarely anyone there who has any expertise in mathematics and almost never even a math person in the room. Uh, I, I, I know that anecdotally having gone to a bunch of these and being the only math person in the room. And uh, at more formal places, say the Santa Cruz uh, Science Communication Program, uh, of over the 400 uh, graduates, there's um, one hand's worth of people with uh, mathematics background uh, who are uh, either currently uh, in it or have graduated from it. So there is a real lack uh, of mathematical communication training opportunities. And uh, I want to offer that to some people. Look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I was about to stop you when you mentioned there is currently no training at all. It, but I was like, wow, period. You should have like paused and just waited. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments. 
my initial thought right now is who is the people that you're looking for? Are you looking for what age group, what educational level? Is it like something wide variety? I mean, like obviously I guess we're supposed to narrow. So like what's your target people that you're looking for? Is it uh, more graduate students or professors or different, different, uh, I don't know, group? <laughs> Um, so I, I, just, I didn't happen to say that. I have thought about this, thankfully. Uh, and uh, my um, right now, there are two main audiences uh, that I would generally uh, attempt to reach uh, for this initial bit, which would be uh, both undergraduate math majors uh, who are looking to continue on uh, in their mathematics education or uh, graduate students. Uh, my thoughts would be these audiences, mostly because they're the ones who are most likely to accept trainings. Uh, and I, I have a good connection with the mathematics department here who uh, would likely allow me to run this as an REU for undergraduates. Uh, so that would be a good uh, fit. And as far as who I want to reach and who I want to be telling these, I want people who are passionate about mathematics and who have an interest in doing this. Communicating, I mean, SCICOM, uh, math communications, any of these, they all, you always have to have some level of passion to do this work uh, because uh, the institutional, um, the, the institutional uh, support is not always there, and sometimes it can even be a negative in your tenure review, say, that you have done this work. Uh, and uh, therefore, it does require people who want to do it. Uh, and so this was, this is not something that I want to reach everybody with. It's something that I want to reach uh, a small group of people who will uh, really be passionate and will want to continue to do this work uh, going forward. Thanks, Sam. I think that's great. And by the way, if you get inspired, by, you know, you see points of collaboration, and, you know, with, with people, go for it. Go for it. All right. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Nisha, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, Sam. Um, do you have in mind like? I know you're thinking about this, but like an idea of what would you would, would you like to develop? Is it it's a course? It's a short training? It's a collaborating with Psycom or someone who already like already exists? Like what do you have in mind? Uh, do you want me to answer? Or uh, I, I want to or... point out I, I want to point out something here. That, thank you for actually giving me that chance. Um, so everybody is already, I think the, the problem is clear enough that people are already jumping at the possible solution for you, right? So Sam, pay attention to that and everybody, right? That's what you want, where you've articulated the problem so well that everybody's like, tell me, tell me, tell me, is it, is it a game? Is it a board game? Wait, what, what, what is this, right? <laughs> Oh, I, I wish that I was skilled enough with uh, game <laughs> mechanics to design a board game. That is as well outside of my areas of expertise. I, I have been a uh, podcaster and mathematical storyteller for the past decade. Uh, so uh, I would uh, use, use those skills as well as, as some other, I've gone through a lot of uh, SciComm training. So I have a lot of that knowledge as well. And so I would use that to develop a, uh, my plan would be uh, for a in, uh, summer incubator type thing for a, a small cohort of, of people. Uh, and then um, after, after being done with that, where I would uh, discuss audio production, uh, narrative, uh, other storytelling, uh, things like that, I would then uh, after that, work one-on-one -on -one with people over a longer period of time for them to report out and produce an episode of a relatively prime stories from the mathematical domain which is a twice kickstarted podcast of mine uh, that uh, i would uh, and then everyone would actually have like this tangible real item this real uh, artifact that they have created uh, that could be released uh, that would be released uh, to the public and so uh, especially for the, you know, undergraduates, graduate students, that it's always really helpful to give them that thing that they can you know, put on a CV or mention in uh, a you know, cover letter uh, moving forward. Wonderful. I'm gonna really- Yeah, that sounds pretty look, cool. We're gonna dig deep, deep into that as we get in, in, in there later in the week. So, so Kushbu, all right, your turn. Okay, um, all right. So I think, um, 
my I wanted to like not go ahead with the solutions. I'm going to start with the problem, <laughs> and this is particularly uh, about documenting uh, and more specifically about hands-on making or the maker community um, and their issues when it comes to documenting the entire process of making a product or a prototype or any sorts of or any sort of fabrication. Um, the goal is to kind of bring out this messy process as something that's equivalent to the finished product, which you know usually in the real world has a lot of weightage and value. Um, and, um, and the goal is to kind of put them on, a, uh, on the same scale of uh, balance where uh, the, the process can be highlighted as uh, um, like a way where you can take in um, information like as other makers for inspiration or ideas, um, and, and as a you know, pathway of communication uh, while making something. Um, so, so a solution that uh, I'm thinking of right now, again, it's a very dynamic part, is uh, something very similar to the Mobius strip video we watched as one of the, the resources for this week. And I picked out the attitude uh, and the environment parallel because uh, I am myself a maker and I love hands-on making. And uh, my personal interests are more in the, in the process because they have taught me a lot. Uh, but again, when it comes to, you know, putting something on the CV or kind of developing uh, the website, the, the main thing that's eye catching is the final product. And it, it, it kind of bums me out because for me, it, the, the process is more beautiful. And I feel like it, it has just so many more paths for others to kind of see and be like, oh, I see this junk, this fits in my project, even if it's completely a different end goal uh, from, you know, what I have produced as a final result. So I feel like the, the, that, that the process has more to offer and is um, very rich. Um, so my goal is as a solution to come up with an environment parallel to this attitude of mine, which is to come up with a maker con or a make a thon of sorts to kind of bring together this community of makers who believe uh, and kind of connect with this thought of how important the, the, the process is and how, you know, the, the, the documentation and the kind of um, the step by step um, process of brainstorming or ideation is. And to kind of bring them together and um, ask them to create something um, in terms of a documentation portal, where uh, they come up with solutions which are you know pertinent to the community, and they they come up with something that is novel or uh, cross learning uh, and uh, like offers ways of cross learning basically. So that's that's kind of staggered and rugged for now. I understand, but that's that's exactly where I am. It's a gray area. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just confused. Okay, <laughs> uh, in a sense, um, in a good way. By the way, Kushbu is my mentee, so I'm 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 allowed to give her a hard, harder time. <laughs> um, I, I think no, I I will stop questions. Okay, Kushbu, I like the idea. I think obviously, as we all do, we're doing some refinement. Um, my initial thought was, what's the purpose of documentation? Like, I thought you were originally going to like, hey, I want to help them document so that regulatory wise, they have all their paperwork ready to file a patent, which might be an interesting way to go and like possibly a part of it, or maybe you don't go that part. But I think from what I heard you say at the end, it was, hey, I want to help them document so that others can see the process and like take part of it and run with it. But then also, I guess another concept that popped in my mind was like, oh, would people want to share that? Because maybe that's also their part of their IP. And like, that's also things I think you'll dissect as we go along. But the documentation, the purpose of the documentation was something that came to mind for me. Yeah, uh, keep that in mind, Kushbu. Okay, question for that. Any other comments, Sam? Uh, it, this might be tangential. Uh, Mandy's question just made me wonder for, uh, this for this type of intellectual property that you are discussing and I like I code I'm terrible at documenting any level of code like anything you can do that can help figure out how to document stuff I'm 100% behind you uh but uh is are these things copyrighted or patented um like I I, I just like that's just a question I have because we go ahead yeah, um, that's that's actually a great question. It's kind of a it's it 
again, the, it's it's kind of in the gray area because I, I built something and and it it's completely like recently I was into this process of you know figuring out if I want to patent something or copyright it and it's it's just so confusing because it's like on the edge all always like it's on the borderline and it's kind of up to the maker as to how far they want to take it depends on the funding they have so I guess that's a that's a that's a completely reasonable factor to you know to consider so thank you for bringing that up I definitely was not thinking about the IP uh, rights so thanks thanks to both of you and I would add so Mandy's question was very much my my, my question and we can definitely dig deeper into that in our one-on-one -on -one, um, because I think it's a critical one going back to the problem right the mm -hmm. she's asking what, what what is it about this documentation that's so critical right and i think you're gonna have to open up that box a little bit more to really get in there and understand the real so the, the, not the real problem but the problem right to nation's point talking to these uh the makers already getting that insight and data uh would give you um i think useful inf information in terms of how to articulate it uh further uh, Nisha, any any comments? Yeah, I was thinking like if, if I could buy kind of like what Sam was saying, if I could buy a book or a manual manual where you can show me, okay, I mean, maybe you can have like a general example so that people are not fighting, oh, that's mine, that's my idea, but you know. But yeah, just step by step, like what do I need to do, right? If I want to um, have a patent, like what are the steps that I do from beginning to, to the end product? in that writing process, documentation process. Yeah, and the audience as well, who, who are these makers, right? Yeah. The maker is one thing. And for all of you, mm -hmm. publics, like publics actually is the actual term. There are many publics, it's not just one. The public is a very diverse body. And uh, so be, be very intentional about who you're talking about, right? Public is too broad. Uh, to, to, to say that. that's true yeah that's important like if it's more okay. like for stem people or like a science or engineers or like be specific and don't be scared I, i'll tell you what don't be scared it's really scary going down down that, that specific but it's exactly what you need to do okay uh to really get at that, that issue okay sarah hello hello hi, hi. Um, i'm going to connect with you okay your, the floor is yours can you hear me uh yes okay uh, so I'm trying to throw like a space archaeology day in Colby, Kansas, and that's where I'm from. It's one of the most rural places in America. So I think it's a very important place to go back to, especially since I have that personal connection. It's uh, a hub of 5,000 people, but it's one of the biggest towns for 70 miles, like smaller towns come to us. Um, so out there, there's only about 22% of adults that have either bachelor's or higher degrees and the national and state average is about 33%. So I want to bring higher education out there. And specifically, since my background is space and geology, I thought that was a good thing to do. Plus geology sciences as a whole are declining in majors every single year. And that's just across the nation. So I think one of the best ways to fix kind of both problems is to try to get rural students who have historically not gone to college or not gone into STEM into the geosciences who are already declining in majors. So I thought like that would be a good place. Plus, since I do have the personal connection, I think it would be a good way to like bridge that gap. So my thing is to have an event out in Colby, Kansas. It will be in the new event center. So in the meeting room, I want to have like lecture going on like uh, 15 minute psychom lectures um, if possible I would like to have like space trivia in another meeting room and then in another room I'd like to have like coding projects like for children so they can like get familiar with that since we don't have coding out there like coding classes and then in one of the gyms we have successfully gotten these giant Mars maps from the Buzz Aldrin Foundation so we'll run like kid appropriate activities on those and then in the last gym, we're going to have like small tables and booths that you can walk around and see different experiments going on. Um, I also, if possible, want to get college recruiters. I think that might be at least possible from K-State and KU, which are the two biggest universities in Kansas. Um, it seems promising from the few talks I've already had. 
um, nothing set in stone yet though. And then I want to um, also, we do have a community college in Colby. So in addition to that, I want K-State and KU to do what we call a two and two program. So they design basically a major that would end up with a BS in geology at the end, but you spend two years at the community college and then you finish your two years at the university. So I know that the community college has done that before, but not with the geology bachelors before. So I would like to do that as well. Okay, all right, um, the floor is open. Um, this sounds like a really cool event. Um, I'm absolutely into science education. I used to work at science museums. Um, and I guess, so I, I, I hear you talking about the event and I hear you talking about like um, partnering, partnering with the colleges and, and funneling into programs. And I'm just wondering like, um, I guess is your long-term goal to have like an organization that's offering events that's also like moving towards this goal of working with colleges? I guess I like, I hear a lot of really cool ideas but I'm trying to figure out how they all come together. Yeah, so the problem, well, there's actually multiple problems that I'm trying to address, but the focus I think would be like getting real students into the geosciences. So honestly, just science exposure in general is something I'm also trying to tackle. So that's also one of my goals, but I think the one that I wanna focus on the most would be like getting them into the geosciences whether that's directly like they leave high school and go to a university, or if that means they go to the community college first and then the universities. So um, I've already talked to K-State about partnering with the community college and they seem um, excited to look at those possibilities. Yeah, so um, I think I wanna go back to just the statement you just made, right? Getting rural students into the geosciences. So I'm paying, guys, for all of you, I'm paying very close attention to the problems that you're stating, okay? Because I, I'm trying to figure out how are they connected to the solution, right? So Sarah, getting rural students to geosciences and then you're hosting this event and you're doing a lot of things. And I, to be honest with you, I got lost in there as to how do they all connect to getting the students into the geosciences, right? Okay. You, don't, you, don't, you don't have to answer that, you don't have to answer it. I'm just gonna give you like a high level, like really think deeply about, like when you stay in the problem, really get to the nitty gritty about what exactly is the issue and then think about, well, how does this solution, right? You're gonna do a conference and the whole point here maybe perhaps is to do this exposure and targeting these high school students that are at that interface where they're gonna to go to college. And what we wanna see is them signing up, I don't know if geosciences is a major, first of all, um, but signing up to become geoscientists or something. But but Sarah, do, do you have thoughts on what sort of that comment and- uh, yeah. yeah, so some of the earlier outreach I've done, I realized that not a lot of people in general, regardless yeah. of rural or urban, actually know what geologists do. Like there's so many different options. So the first part is really just exposure right off the bat. We're doing exposure and if this, we're hoping this could be sustainable from year to year. So like juniors, we target now, will come again the next year and then decide mm -hmm. to move on or just like as they grow up. So the first part is right for that, just exposure for the general public and the students. Because the other thing that I'm dealing with is that, and I dealt with this personally, my mother was like, why are you getting a bachelor's in geology? Like, what can you even do with that? So it's not just convincing students, they can, get a bachelor's in geology, you gotta convince your parents. So that's why a public event instead of like school events is why I think like we can actually bridge these gaps. It's, we're getting the exposure out there. They get to see real scientists do cool things. They get to talk to college recruiters at the end of the event and just like starting to get those seeds planted. So I don't think like right off the bat, we're gonna get like all the new seniors this year or whatever to like do this. But I think that we can start planning to see the, like the younger generation and as they get older and hopefully this is sustainable, even if it's not like every year, if it's every two years, I think we can really start like planting the seeds for the future. 
Other comments? I liked Sarah when you talked just like right then when you talked about like exposure, like I think that could be an interesting kind of problem to like people don't even know like I don't know a survey of students who even knows about geology what what do what I honestly I don't even know what careers besides like yeah. I don't know being a geologist and studying rock like that I think that's like the the exposure part is probably a nice piece to kind of roll with. I don't know exactly what, but that that's kind of something that stuck with me about everything that you talked about. And then like having long-term goals that are um, like the longer term stuff that you said about the two plus two. Great, Nisha, anything? Yeah, I can see for example, how you can split this in, in, in two different projects. For example, you could like Mandy mentioned, focus more on the exposure and then just go to out there to K-12 to kids or the general public, but also maybe you can go to the actual like university and see, do they have, okay, they have the mayor in geology or they have a program that will guide these students to, to geology and maybe like focus there to, in, in that population. Those students, you want them to pursue careers in geology. So help them stay there to help them stay in geology or go to do a PhD in that area, what careers, what options they have. Um, because I guess that's also another, that could be another problem. I, I don't know if, it, if it's happening, but that maybe they start in, in undergrad in science, but they, they have no idea at all of what geology is. So that's another group that you could um, focus your, your effort on. And maybe if you have connections already in the school, it might be easier, you can even develop some sort of um, like scholarship or, or internships, you know, so it, it, it depends. I guess you, you, it would be good to try to focus on your, your public or your, your target uh, population. Yeah, uh, remember a problem well stated is a problem half solved, okay? And I wanna commend you all, like what you, just, what you guys just did is really hard. Like, I, I just want to tell you all that right now, right? To share your idea like this and to, to be vulnerable to, to, for people to actually then tell you, well, this part doesn't make sense. And look at people's expressions like, what? What did you just say? What? <laughs> right? Um, and so I want to thank you for sharing that. And I think, I hope this experience really is, builds you up from here as you now begin to say, okay, let's think about how do I learn and build from this, right? This week, it's all about focusing on that problem. Today was day one, <laughs> I hope. And then as you talk with your mentor and others, really try to hone that down, right? And then in the following week as well, we're going to add another layer on top of it for evaluation. And we're going to continue always asking you what's the problem and how does it connect to your sort of the impact that you want to have, right? And you all, some of you already started talking about impact, right? Already and outputs. And the question will always be, well, how does it connect to your problem, right? Does it? And also, how does it connect to what you're doing, right? And what are you going to be measuring? So all these questions start coming up, but you need to have a clear problem statement. It's all built from that foundation that, uh, that then it becomes easier, I think, over time. Um, so guys, I, I've had such a pleasure to, to learn from you and, and, and just absorb this uh, it's a lot my brain is like wow this is intense uh nisha thank you so much do you have any parting wisdom that you want to share with them as they get continue oh my god journey? no you're gonna learn so much in just what three months right it's like, kind of like a program it's it's incredible it's, it's so much learning and um yeah I'm, I'm so happy thank you for the invitation because it's just it's so amazing, like just to hear all these ideas. It's like, oh my gosh, okay, I like that. Oh, I can implement this. Oh, I can collaborate. I can. It's, it's just great. So thank you guys for sharing. Yeah, and, and take advantage of this year because we're doing the flip model. We're very different to Nasia's, Nasia's cohort. Um, we have less talking then. <laughs> we're doing way more talking this time around. <laughs> um, so please, uh, I really appreciate you guys stepping up and. And, and sharing your advice and, and, and asking each other questions. And I hope it doesn't stop here. Please do so use Slack, engage with each other. Um, 
Uh, I've already chatted uh, with Sam already, and I, I thank you, Sam, for that comment in the chat there. Um, and so when you come chat with me again, I, I'm just going to give you a hard time. All right. Just just telling you that right now and, and uh, I, in a very I nice mean, way. <laughs> you, you heard what my original problem statement was, and then I get to just look halfway decent in front of all front of everyone else. And I, I did not want to take credit for that because that was not me. Um, so it, it, it's I promise it's not that um, bad. I'm very, very nice and, and we, we just have fun with it. And my goal is also to just ask you questions and I keep asking questions until there are no other questions. And like, wait, okay. <laughs> well, have a good week, everybody. I look forward to seeing you and seeing updates and please share updates as well in Slack. I'm always excited to see what you guys are doing. Something, Eureka moments, ah, let us know. We really want to know. And Nisha is one of our, current junior residents at SAI. So feel free to reach out to her as well. She's in our Slack world as well. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Easter sure. and Easter as well uh, with that. Okay, everybody, we have five, I've given you five extra minutes back. So yay. Uh, have a good week and um, enjoy. Bye everyone. Have a great week. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody.